Um, so we are starting. This is Tech Talk number 11. So thanks everybody for um, joining. So if you've never joined the Tech Talks program before, what this is is um, a kind of a forum for us to talk about JasperSoft okay. technology in um, front of I our customers know. and community right members. Um, so, so today's topic uh, is about uh, comparing our two metadata kind of uh, technologies and analysis technologies domains and JasperSoft OLAP. So I'm um, joined by Sherman Wood. Um, Sherman's been with the, with the company for many years. He's held many different hats, including uh, engineering positions um, and, and lately um, director of, of technical services for um, North America. So Sherman, thanks a lot for, for being on the on the uh, tech talk today. Uh, sure. So I'll, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you and, and guys in the audience. Remember, you can you can type your questions into the question box at any time. You don't have to wait till the end. You can um, you can go ahead and start now. We'll, we'll try to answer them live throughout the the conversation. And that they, you know they can be about domains and about OLAP, but they can also be about other stuff. So if you have questions about iReport or anything else that's uh, that's coming up, you know feel free to to type away. So with that, uh, yeah, Sherman, I'll, I'll leave you the uh, the presentation. Sure. Thanks, Adisto. Um, yeah, Ernesto suggested this as a um, shootout. Okay, <laughs> we're talking no, okay, Corral here or something like that. Um, really, the the um, you know, JasperSoft has been doing analysis in many different forms over over quite a few years. Um, you know, originally. We, we focused on, you know, the original analysis that's engine not, was uh, was uh, the OLAP engine that we have within JasperSoft, which is uh, based on the um, the open source monitoring arm uh, engine. Um, and you know, increasingly, as we sort of move from uh, usually started with ad hoc report design and and that sort of thing, but then we've really been moving more into using domains in the ad hoc engine as a way to uh, visualize interact with data, so getting much more into the realm of, realm of analysis overall. So, um, you know, we're, so, you know, why why one versus the other, and what's, what's the sort of differences between them? Um, you know, these are, the, these are some of the things you know, that we, we think about in terms of using, um, uh, looking at domains versus, uh, versus the OLAP, versus the OLAP engine. Um, so we're going to sort of talk a bit about the, the general overview and some of it's sort of almost really philosophical uh, distinction, and then we'll get into some of the um, uh, some of the practicalities of uh, using one versus the other, um, and of course volume and complexity, how quickly you know, the speed of, uh, of getting an else back, how quickly does the data change underneath, and where does the data come from? So. Um, just to sort of do the compare and contrast. And then you can just have more so, so let's just talk about all that versus domains. Do the compare and contrast. They, they so, um, domains are um, a, uh, how do I put it? A, um, uh, a humanly sort of understandable view of potentially complex um, data source underneath. Um, there is a, you, you create a domain by connecting to a data source and then providing mapping um, capabilities on top of that to really abstract away um, uh, all, the, all the potential mess of the under, underpinnings of that, that data source. So people are not thinking, that, so your, your customers who are using the domain are not thinking about joins or or anything like that. They're just focused on the actual view of the data. Um, at the moment, we um, really rely on uh, the data source being um, a SQL data source, a relation database, uh, anything connected that's using SQL and JDBC. Um, so that include, you know, we're not quite yet. We'll be getting up into some of the, the connections of the big uh, data um, sources as well, particularly um, Hadoop through Hive. Um, but for right now, you know, it's, it's really oriented towards the typical relation database, the Oracle, the, the MySQL, the SQL servers, etc. Um, uh, the, um, you know, like I said, the, the, there's a mapping done between the actual underpinnings of the um, 
of the database to some humanly understandable terms. Uh, we will, you know, uh, there are. I think, I think that'll pull it back in. Um, there are the, you know, fields and measures. Um, there's sort of uh, some view of structure in there about logical groupings of data through some sort of hierarchy. So basically, you know, just you know, using using this uh, this definition of the domain um, to uh, to to provide that high level structure. There's also other aspects of the domain, like you can um, uh, you can apply domain level uh, security or uh, use use a uh, row level security on it, so that you can automatically filter uh, data that's coming out of the domain. Um, according to the user's profile, normally um, roles there, other other attributes, no, like say the part that they're in. Or like that. Um, there's a query language embedded in it um, called called yeah, Donnie L um, that allows us to uh, do things like generate SQL or use an in-memory cache to calculate aggregations. Um, and we calculate um, we store uh, the data on a uh, at least we're doing the an, an analytics on a per query basis. So essentially as you work with domains, you'll see um, you know, the, 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 the uh, environment will sort of, you, know, you change a filter or something like that, or add a new, add a new field into the, into the mix, it'll go away and query that data. And then, then as you just, if you just interact with that, it'll, um, uh, it'll just work with the data that's in that query. So really essentially goes from just like query to query. That I never got a from. On the OLAP end, it's a different structure. Um, we have, uh, it relies on a, on a star schema, which is a, you know, another way to, uh, a, a, it's a way to structure data. People talk about, you know, first, second, third, so after fifth normal form, etc. cetera. Um, the star schema um, uh, is another, uh, yeah, another way to, to structure data. It started in the early 90s, um, Ralph Kimball, and uh, yeah. etc. You know, build, build up then, that, the, the long, sort of theory behind that. So you see the, these fact tables, which are very detailed, um, uh, detailed uh, sets of information. You know, individual measures like a, like the, um, uh, like a sale, uh, an individual sale or something like that. Um, and then each of those, each of those uh, facts are uh, categorized and provided in ways by dimensions, like the time, the the store, etc. So. Um, so there is a, um, there is, you know, equivalent domains, there is a, um, a schema file which defines that structure and the relationships between the columns, et cetera, in the database, and again, presenting it in a human legal form. Um, it uses uh, 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 an OLAP-specific um, query language called MDX, which is very powerful um, in, in comparison to the, the DOM-EL uh, uh, language we have in domains. Um, and uh, it has a very sophisticated in-memory cache um, that uh, really, you know, as, as people interact with the um, uh, with the uh, with the uh, OLAP cube, which will cube terminology there, um, it will it will build up um, uh, things in, in it, elements in its cache so that it increasingly does not need to go back to the database. In contrast to the way that um, I'll make sure I'll be around on my desk. So I think. Probably the main difference between them, from from my perspective, is the philosophy. Really, yeah. you know, OLAP was thinking about the star, this sort of star scheme. You can put a, you can impose a structure, um, right, um, uh, a, a, a OLAP structure or a star scheme on, on top of a regular transactional um, database. But uh, typically, um, typically there's, you know, it's, it tends to be a specialized database with this, this, sort of, this fact and dimension. Um, Dimension table um, sort of realm. Um, so often there's there's a need to, to do um, extract, transform, and load, and you really it really relies on clean data overall. Whereas domains don't require as much; they really just require a, a database, and then you can impose whatever structure you want on top of that um, through the uh, through the domain uh, to, through the domain structure. Um, you can use it for operational data, like just against your transaction environment. Um, sometimes people uh, do create, you know, separate reporting and analysis uh, data databases, but you can use it for that operational data. And it is, you know, it just has, it does have a lot of flexibility um, uh, with, you know, uh, on, on the domain side. So 
one of one of the main things. Yeah, that and, I, I'll, and I'll stop you just for a, just for a second there, Sherman. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, part part of the reason why I'm having or, or or had you on the on the show to do this is, I get asked that question a lot. Well, which mm -hmm. route should I go? Should I go the domains or should mm -hmm. I go the OLAP route? And mm -hmm. it, almost every single time they say, well, we got started with domains because it was easy, yeah. you know, because they were just able to. Yep loaded on top of their operational data mm -hmm. and usually about six months later they come and ask me, I, I think I see why I should have gone the OLAP route or at least should have gone away from my operational data and, and all mm -hmm. that stuff. So mm -hmm. anyway, it's just a little a uh, little side story, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it, um, I think I think domains are, uh, are great to get um, to get really started with or if you are just say doing reporting and, and, out, and you know essentially sort of lighter analysis on top of your you know your existing existing say application or something like that. Um, you know we we often find that uh, if you want to do you know one of the things and we'll get into this, this a little bit later you know the, the some of the sophisticated calculations that you can do in an OLAP environment really I mean you know regardless of whether it's domain or OLAP you do need a good structure in there you know people do need to think about about dimensions, right? How do I categorize all this data, right? Um, so, uh, you know, typically time is seen as a dimension. Uh, the location, as we've got here, is, is seen as dimension. Um, so, uh, because this is the way that people want to be able to, uh, to see and interact with the, um, with, with, the, um, with the information in a, in a structured way. Whereas domains are great at like just exposing sort of everything but it doesn't, you know, you've got to do, you know, you've still got to provide that, that work and you can do it in domains uh, very well to give people some structure there, but really on the OLAP end uh, you do get, um, there, there's a lot, there is a lot uh, more assumption structure and you get more power out of it because of that. Um, so uh, let's see, thinking, yeah, so what was I just I was saying to a um, Ernesto just before, you know, I, a lot of people don't think dimensionally. Um, one of the main things in, in, in OLAP is, is uh, when we talk about a dimension, it's a hierarchy. So going from a very broad um, uh, particular dimension, like you know, I've got, um, you know, we have a have a food mart um, uh, example, um, which has got basically um, the, the the facts. Uh, um, you know, I bought this product. Somebody bought this product in this store on this date. Um, and uh, no, 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 so the, the per, you know, there's dimensions around that. Who's the customer? What is the time? What is the what is the store? Right. So the store sits in the city, in the state, in the country. It's got a store manager. Um, you know, the time is also potentially got a hierarchy on as well. Which a lot of you'll see a lot in, in warehouses where it goes from like uh, year, month, or year, quarter, month. Day sometimes you know some people want to do it down to the, the minute and the second depending on the um, that uh, depending on your um, you know your data your and how granular you want your information so um, so the whole whole sort of modeling aspect is very uh, very important in, so that you can actually give useful information so one of the, one of the other aspects of this dimensional thinking is being able to think about the aggregation so quite often with analysis you want to do ratios. What is the um, what is the today's store sales versus the month's store sales, or you know the quarter, or something like that? So, um, uh, uh, or um, uh, you know what, what, uh, some measure on male versus female, for example. So um, a lot of the a lot of the slicing and dicing um, of uh, of uh, the that people want to do over over the information is via these hierarchies and being able to compare the ratios, etc. On that, um, I talked about the importance of time. It's very it tends to be very important in warehouses. So, um, like I want to do year over year. What is you know same period last year? What is the, again that ratio bit? Whereas in uh, domains, you really have to you have to define them, but you can do it. But um, it's really not sort of baked into the environment. Um, so, so back to the you know to Ernesto's point about you know which one should I use? If you want to you know I, both both um, both uh, approaches 
give a structure for information um, for sort of in, for end users to consume. There's, there's more power on the on the on the um, on the OLAP end of things because of hierarchies and the use of some of these powerful um, uh, these powerful uh, aggregation functions and ratios that uh, people want to do. I mean, you get into all sort of linear regressions and many other things um, within the within the OLAP environment, but it does require um, uh, a fair bit, a lot of structure and clean data um, within within um, within that star schema that you need to define. Whereas domains can can deal with sort of mess a bit more. You know, you can oppose it against a transactional model. So um, so with so another another thing is the the sort of user experience between um, between the two. So um, one of the things that we've been working on over the years with JasperSoft is you know any data. Um, for, uh, you know, with a, essentially a common tool set, um, being able to report and analyze that. And really, you know, I, I think initially uh, domains started pretty basic, but they've been growing in power over the years. And now we're starting to get uh, some some sort of equivalency there in terms of in terms of the power between domains and all that from a user experience point of view. Um, actually, one of the things we did in 5.0. Um, was uh, we, we previously had a separate um, user interface for interacting with uh, with, OLAP, with, uh, with the Jasper Soft OLAP environment. Now we've still got that, that old interface, which people call JPivot Pivot there. But now we've uh, done some we've done some consolidation. So um, you know you can start with when you go into uh, the data visualization aspects of, um, of Jasper Soft, you can select a domain, you can select a topic. Which is just a query, basically parameterized query, um, which can really. So I mentioned domains have to go against SQL, a SQL database, um, uh, and so does a, uh, a mon, uh, the OLAP piece also needs to go against a star schema, but again a ratio database. Topics can go against anything, so they, you get this uh, this ability to interact with the data through just a, essentially a query against any old data source, and that can be. You know, the way we do things against a lot of the big data pieces, etc., as well. So, um, you know, with all that, how you know one of the one of the things with particularly this interactive environment is um, people don't want to wait, and that is of course um, a uh, uh, you know something that w when you've got I don't know reams of data behind the scenes. I mean, you know, we're talking. I was talking to a customer the other day. Where their all app environment was going to be, even even if they did some, um, they took from their transactional system and they did aggregation. They did a had an extract transform load process to put it into a, a star schema. But even and they were aggregating. They went for going from you know individual transactions in their transaction database to maybe summarizing those transactions by day in the in their star schema environment. Even at that even with that summarization, it's going to be billions. Of rows in the central fact table, right? So when you've got those sorts of things, you know, and people, you know, people interacting don't they don't they don't know or, or care about how um, how much data is behind the scenes. They just expect things to return quickly. So um, that's a constant challenge for us as a as a BI uh, vendor. Um, yeah, and, so, and the standard the standard's been set so high. I mean, when when you go and you query Google, Google doesn't put up a message saying, "Hey, sorry, we have to go through uh, you know several trillion pages. Um, we'll be back in half an hour." It comes sorry. back sub milliseconds, so it's like people mm -hmm. just expect everything to come back immediately, and, and they don't realize that there's work behind it. Right. Uh, at least the end users don't. The, probably the folks on this. Uh, on this tech talk, do realize that there's work behind everything that comes back quickly. So, exactly. um, um, so you know, the, the way we um, the way we allow that um, that interaction to happen, so that people come along and say, "I'm looking at a particular, you know, I've got this this, this dimension," and you can you can set them certainly up in both um, uh, in both domains and and the OLAP. So I've got a time dimension. I'm going to you know, go down, look all my years, and I'm going to, you know, drill down to the next level and see all the, the months within those years, etc. Behind the scenes, we're doing queries and pulling them into caches, both in domains and OLAP. Um, as I said before, domains 
uh, query things at uh, cache things at a query level. So a query is run that um, that you know needs to pull additional you know it's like an initial set of information or a change set of information. Like I started using uh, started interacting with some data, I added I pulled in an additional column, um, you know, in, or I uh, applied a, a different filter, right? So that each time those sort of things happen with domains. They will go out, and the, the query will happen. We'll pull that into into the into the cache, um, and then as people if people are just moving around within that, it doesn't go back to the database again. It it just uh, does things that are at an in memory sort of speed. Um, so the OLAP side of things does things in a much more sophisticated sort of way. It it really it doesn't uh, it doesn't um, cache queries like row by row, um, it uh, caches results. So when you, it, it knows, you know, this, you know, what's the, uh, what's the summarization of that particular measure, like store sales, um, uh, over, you know, over time. It'll, you know, as people interact with it, it will, you know, every time there's a, like a, a new dimension or something like that, or a new level that, that is being asked for, it'll go out and query that and pull that into cache, but then it won't go back and do that again. So um, it is um, is very uh, um, it's it's a very sophisticated cache that's been been used for quite a number of years, but it really does leverage this dimensionality and categorization that the OLAP environment uh, imposes. Um, yeah, one one thing. Um, oh, sorry, I, I no, forgot okay. that this slide was in there. Um, no, I was going to say about the the aggregate tables, but uh, I forgot that there's a whole slide on that. I, I thought I'd left it out. So great. Right. Um, so, one of the things, uh, you know, I mentioned um, aggregation where, you know, we had a customer who had, you know, a very large sort of transactional environment, multi-tenant, so many different customers generating essentially machine level types of, it was actually quick data, etc. Um, and storing that on a very, very detailed level, but when they moved it across into into their reporting and analysis environment, they aggregated. They didn't, they didn't you know, I actually was suggesting to them, you don't want to store transaction by transaction. It's stored in like 15-minute intervals. Aggregate all the results up to 15-minute intervals, and then you know, so that that actually can um, uh, that actually can reduce the the amount of data you're holding, um, and and also um, uh, and and you know, and therefore make you know database queries etc. Um, more perform better. Um, you can even go a step beyond that on the OLAP, on the, on, on the, on the, within the schema. You can sort of pre-aggregate things. So say you've got a, um, a SAR schema that has a fact table categorized by time and customer and product. You can create a table because you know that um, time is being used quite often. You know, time is maybe stored down. Uh, you know, it's individual tra transactions are being stored. You know, transaction by transaction, the sale. Of, you know, this product happened on this date in this store. You know, that sort of thing. So you can you could you can do with uh, pre-aggregate pre things, knowing that a lot of work is done over time. You can say, well, why don't I create an aggregate that that summarizes things up to say the month level? Because that's a, what a lot of uh, what a lot of, you know, you don't tend to go down today, right? You can, you let's, so let's create a separate fact table that doesn't have, you know, every single individual transaction. It summarizes things up to a month level across all the dimensions. Um, and there, there are, there's some tools to um, help you um, work out what are the best aggregates to, to use. Um, but that's uh, something that's very powerful. Uh, and so, so what 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 you can actually do with the OLAP engine is identify these aggregate tables, these pre-aggregated tables, and the and the engine is smart enough to say, well, if I'm doing something, um, say I, I'm not going down to a day level, I can use this month level aggregate aggregate table to go and summarize that, rather than you know, so you get some quite dramatic um, in, increases in performance there. Unfortunately, domains cannot do this today because it, it, they they just don't have that sort of thing. Um, and uh, Ernesto put this up, and I have to, you know, have, to <laughs> have to agree that the um, you know the OLAP end of things certainly doesn't win on the on the caching end. But 
again, you know, that it doesn't have the because it imposes a certain model upon the data. It's it, you know you can't be uh, you don't have flexibility that you have domains. But you know there is there is there is caching going on in both. But I'd say OLAP is definitely the the one that does much more sophisticated caching at this point. We're probably getting better at that over time, as always. Right, right. Okay. Um, we have so we have a, a f about three questions that have come in, Sherman. So mm -hmm. I'll stop the presentation. Sure. Um, should be pretty quick ones. So first question is, can we use a hierarchical data structure within OLAP, or do we have to flatten it out? Hmm. Hierarchical data structure. Yeah, um, I think we can make that question more complicated than it is. I, I'm not sure if they mean that it's in uh, separate tables, or do they really mean a true hierarchy? Um, typically, um, you know, with a with a um, with a star schema, the the model is you've got this big you've got this fact table which has got all the details in it, and then the dimension table. And each dimension table there tends to be one dimension table per per dimension. If there are multiple dimension tables, you have what is called a snowflake. So the uh, thing would be typically you will see in, in um, a lot of the, a lot of these in these uh, in these databases um, there'll be like a timetable and that that timetable will have on it by fair means or foul um, all the breakdown so it'll have a date field on there but it'll also have a year and a month and a quarter and a day of month right and then your OLAP schema can break that down and say, well, you know, the, the, the hierarchy is year, quarter, month, day of month, right? And that's all in one table. Um, that's more for performance, um, and you you will have a you'll have a single foreign key uh, related to that to that dimension table from the fact. Um, sometimes you'll see um, snowflakes, which is more conforming to a third uh, third normal form sort of approach where you'd have a, rather than having just the one, say, timetable, you'd have a year table, a, uh, a, month, a, a quarter, a month, and a day of month um, table. And then the day of month table would be the, would have the foreign key into the fact table. Um, so in, in OLAP you can do both. And certainly in domains you can, you can work in either way as well. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, it did. It did. Um, the next one was actually: uh, Is a star schema necessary? Can we use multiple dimensions within an entity? So I believe you just answered that mm -hmm. um, with with the snowflake structure. Yeah, the, the snowflake structure. Um, it it tends to be it, you know sometimes you've got sort of a more of an object model with a sort of built-in hierarchy there that. That can, that can, you know, and you will say your transactional environment, and that, that will certainly work. Um, uh, but generally, generally, we find that a lot of people, you know, will create a star scheme if they're going down that way. Like that. Great. Okay. And then the final question before we uh, get back to the slides is: um, in the OLAP workbench, is there a way to restrict what data is returned in the cube, putting a filter on the facts and dimensions that are not exposed? To the user, so row level uh, and I yep. suppose column level with the dimension. Right, um, there is. Um, I mentioned that the um, domains have an, uh, an ability to um, filter according to the user profile. Um, there is, and this is a. Uh, if you look in some of the documentation, you, you will see see the, the definition. There's an XML file which basically breaks things down, um, sort of categorizes the um, things by essentially often by role, but it can be more, more granular than that to automatically uh, apply filters. So you, there is the equivalent uh, in the commercial editions of, of Jaspersoft. Um, there is um, uh, an ex a separate, a, a separate uh, definition that allows you to apply um, the same level of um, uh, same level of security, sort of by role and by user profile, etc. Um, 
uh, against the against the cube as well. So it's not on a on a row by row basis. You can do things like, um, and you can do this a bit in domains, but it's 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 a lot easier in, on the OLAP end. Say uh, somebody who is a manager of a particular set of stores, they can see their stores, but they can't see other people's stores. You can do those sorts of you can set up that sort of uh, security on, on the OLAP end. Yeah, and I think, do we ship, um, does the Food Mart Cube ship with any, any um, security defined, like the, yeah. the sample one? Oh, okay, okay. And that, when would you, that be when you log in, is, when you, there, there's a, a California user. So if you go oh. into the, when you, if you download Jaspersoft, um, it comes with a set of samples, including data and uh, dashboards and many things. It comes with a, some OLAP definitions. You heard you talk about the Food Mart. It's a very old, old data set. Um, that um, has some of the definitions that we've got there have got some security defined against it. And if you go in, you, you can log in as the California user who is restricted to just California and not uh, Oregon and Washington and Mexico and other parts of, uh, other parts of the, the data set that's actually in that food mart environment. And you will see, so if you go between like a, a, a super user, like a Jasper admin, versus the California user, you will see the difference. You'll, you'll go into the same view of information and you'll see different data because of the security. Yeah, and, and actually the same story with the domain, guys. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Supermart domain that we ship, same story. You'll, um, you'll get this, if you log in as California user, you get to see different things. And there's something with the HR um, that we limit for col column level security. Right. Uh, all right, so I think that's the, the questions for now, and you can uh, continue on. Thanks a lot, Sherman. Okay. Uh, now we're going for time, but uh, 35 minutes. Okay. Uh, so let's go about the complexity of queries and calculations. Um, you can define quite a lot of pretty, pretty, uh, pretty powerful um, calculated fields. Um, they are... Um, Particularly with domains, you know, I talked about topics as well. But you know, with domains, um, there is some sophistication in terms of you know using the uh, the underlying database to do some of the calculations there. Um, but it's really not aware of this dimensionality that I mentioned before. Um, uh, on the OLAP end, you can do a lot more. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of time, um, you you you'll, you would be working with this. Um, I talked about this MDX language which you can um, embed in the schema to put the calculated members there. There's not as many, it's, it's more difficult to, to do that interactively um, through the user interface. Um, some of, you know, can put in user-defined functions, but there's, a, there's quite a, there's a, uh, I think there's well over 400 um, uh, functions that can be used on the OLAP end for calculated members. Um, and uh, and it, you know always does a lot of work pushing down to the underlying database. It's very efficient to do the calculations there. Um, uh, let's see. In the shared dimension piece, um, here is an example of. You've got these fact tables: one sales, and one's inventory. They both refer to a store and time. Um, and Whereas, and the sales fact has an additional dimension related to it called promotions, right? So in, on, the, on the OLAP end of things, on the uh, Jasper's OLAP end of things, um, you would define these hierarchies, state, a, a store, a time, and a promotion hierarchy. You define cubes, one's called, one will be around the sales fact table with, with time, store, and promotions. Inventory fact would just have store and time as, as dimension to it. Um, so the, you know these would be presented as different entry points, um, different sort of clusters of data, um, and uh, the uh, the OLAP end of things just shares things very nicely across that. Um, it is it's messier in the um, uh, in the domain side, of so you can certainly do it, but you'll end up with all, you'll see some duplication and that sort of thing when you, when you define structures. Yeah, just just to be clear, in, in domains you can do this, you would make a copy of the table, not, not on the database, but in the domain definition. Mm -hmm. 
and I think maybe what what I didn't add to this slide, probably because I ran out of room, is that um, if I want to take a fact from stores and a fact from inventory, or from sales and one from inventory, and do some sort of calculation, the OLAP motor lets me do that, and it'll issue several SQL statements um, against mm -hmm. You know the database, and it'll come back with the results. Whereas, yeah, domains like uh, Sherman said will will probably duplicate some data. But if you just want to look at, if you want to have a shared dimension that works great in domains, if you want to have a shared dimension and and do some aggregates between the two fact tables, that's where domains falls a little short. Just wanted to add that clarification. Okay. Um. Let's see. Uh, yes, the multipass SQL thing. Um, uh, I talked about domains basically caching queries, um, the results of queries, um, and you know allowing. Yeah, and then it will, whenever the, um, whenever the uh, the set of set of data changes, like you add a new column or you apply a different filter or something like that, it will go out and requery, right? Um, so that's essentially more of a single pass sort of style. Um, on the OLAP end, as I described before about uh, the way that the caching works, it will basically sort of build up uh, a view of the, you know, the, 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 the data, the underlying data in memory over time. So it sort of will, I don't have, you know, it'll, you'll start an interaction, do some initial queries, and then, you know, say you drill to a different level of detail, we'll only do it then, it'll store the, the result. And so the next time you go down to that level, maybe from a different perspective or add additional data with a filter or something like that or remove it, it will just work on memory. So really, um, you know, really the, the, the OLAP thing is very, uh, the OLAP side thing is very much on that, that multiple pass as well. Okay, how quickly does data change underneath? Um, so, we uh, on the OLAP end, it's it's not really oriented towards real time data or frequently changing data because of that caching mechanism. And because typically, you know, these sort of star schema things, because they, you know, there's a usually a process to clean up data maybe from multiple data sources to stick it into this one this one uh, reporting and analysis environment. Um, typically overnight sort of runs, etc. Um, so, you know, that so our uh, so in that case, um, you know, the the, the all app sort of environment that we have is much more iron towards, you know, we keep the stuff in we keep information in memory. We don't need to go back to the database all the time. But if data's changing underneath, we're not going to pick that up until we do things like clear the cache out, which is you know typically done whenever. You know, you need to do that whenever data comes in. You need to know when that is and, and, and schedule that, etc. Um, on the domain side, um, uh, on the domain side, that's not the case. It really is just only when when query, when the data uh, when you change the change your view of information, it'll go out and requery. So if data's rapidly changing underneath it, domains are going to pick up the latest changes um, over time. Uh, Yes, so in this sort of thing, so when when do you need to create a, a, a separate reporting and analytic environment? Um, you know, the, so it is it is over here to go and do this, to go and create uh, something that pulls data out of your transactional system and move it into uh, a different environment, um, and then do your reporting analysis against that. Domains do tend to need less ETL. They don't need to go and uh, that they can go against the transaction environment, but what you what we, we find a lot is um, people uh, people don't want these what I call analytic queries to go and hit their transaction environment. You know, generally when you're working with reporting analysis, you're, you're you're aggregating and doing say bulk you know, sort of queries that hit many parts of the database all at once, rather than sort of more on a transaction by transaction basis. Um, so the, the the use characteristics are very different, um, and it can uh, you know they can cause they cause a very different load on the database um, compared to uh, a transaction transactional uh, sort of, uh, interaction. So um, we do see quite a lot of people 
you know, creating, you know, have, separating out their data. If you're doing things like aggregating data across a number of different uh, data sources, for example, you know, Jaspersoft does this themselves. We have Salesforce, we have Intact, which is a, a SaaS general ledger environment, uh, accounting system. We have adaptive planning, which is a budgeting environment. Um, we have Marketo for marketing. We wanted to sort of consolidate that information and then be able to do things, you know, from sales through marketing, for example. You know, you can't do that in one spot. You've got to pull it together. So that we, we see, you know, that, that's the sort of model that people um, use uh, to, you know, set up these these reporting and analytic um, environments sort of across data sources. The last one, the last sort of reason I see people using um, uh, using the separate reporting and analytic um, database is uh, history. Uh, a lot of the time. You know, for your transactional environment, you don't people don't really need a lot of history. Um, you may want, may want to keep the last sort of year, but sort of past that, it tends not to be that that important. And, and maybe for performance issues and that sort of thing, you want to pull out that data, so you want to keep a short amount of history there. But in your reporting and analytic environment, you may want to keep you know years and years and years of history to you know a fine level of detail or some aggregate level of detail. So you can do that. You can just sort of say, well, I, you know. It's the, the, the reporting analysis environment is not a mirror in some way, shape, or form of the transactional environments. It is just a, you know, it's going to keep history you know, for, for whatever period of time. There's a whole methodology around, you know, set of methodologies around managing that sort of warehouse type of thinking. Um, so, you know, ETL, ETL is, is, you know, often needed. It doesn't have to be. Um, Really, you know, for domains don't need to use ETL uh, nearly as much. Maybe for performance, as at some of the situations I mentioned, and um, and on the OLAP end, generally there's a restructuring of the data going from uh, going from the transaction environment to the reported analysis environment. Maybe blending with other other data sets, for example. So they tend to need an ETL process because you want good clean data in the warehouse. So. Um, uh, so, you know, Ernesto said, um, hang on, where are we going here? How quickly, you know, if you really want, if you really want um, real, basic real-time access to data, domains are it. You, you know, if, if that is not your requirement, then you can certainly, you know, you're probably going to be doing some things with, uh, with a separate, a separate data source. And, and going on from there. So domains certainly do have that, have that real time access. Right. And, and at the same time, I mean, ETL, so you, you, you used the example of our internal use of ETL and all those different systems. I believe we run those jobs every 15 minutes. Um, I couldn't imagine possibly needing data newer than 15 minutes for an internal kind of traditional business intelligence use case. Um, well, you know, it, other it, it, types it, of data you you might want quicker than 15 minutes, but uh, so so it all kind of depends, and, and that's why I'm trying to add. It's about asking these questions. If you do need very near time data, mm -hmm. then probably domains or you know ETL is probably just not an option for you. Um, any questions there? Um, yeah, there's there's another one that's come in. Um, it's yeah. It's, it's it's around the discussion we're having. When do you consider data to be changing fast for OLAP? Once a day, once a week, etc. Um, it depends on your use case. Um, really gets down to how current do you want the information in your warehouse, right? Um, you know, quite often we will see sort of a blend of things going on where. Um, I do have some sort of set of reports that are like, I don't know, troubleshooting or give me the status on this right now. You know, I'm supporting, you know, something for a call center, right? So, you know, a uh, person's got a customer on the phone and they need a set of information about, you know, this customer right now. And that really needs to be, you know, real time sort of work. Um, you know, something could have happened, you know, they could be going back and forth during the day, for example. Um, um, generally, when you're doing more analysis, you're looking more at trending. Um, 
what what happened you know, over the last sort of time period, um, and uh, what is you know what are some of the metrics around that? So sort of performance, key performance indicators, you know, etc. So that so the real time nature of things is, is different. Um, that that said, you know, people often often push it. You know, they do want to. Uh, you know, you, they do want to uh, summarize, summarize things and provide near real time. You know, maybe intraday things. So, uh, you know, I want this an overnight sort of set of processing and data. I want to have that updated at midday. You know, that so maybe twice a day. It really does depend on your um, on your you know processing requirements and the, the needs of your needs of your customer base. Yeah. Right, and I suppose the rest of it is going to be a matter of how fast are your databases, how fast are your ETL jobs running, how fast is your aggregate table going to be able to build. And so that's that's going to be more along the constraints if you're pushing towards near time or real time. Well, it's usually you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the needs, for, needs for information from your customers tend to drive everything else. Well, I can't get that data through, you know, um, overnight. Where you better go and work that out, <laughs> sort of thing is, you know, have those sorts of sorts of discussion. Well, are you willing to pay more for that? I, yes, I need that. You know, I need the information, right? Those sorts of things. So um, it does tend to, you know, generally it's it is the the, the customers' requirements for information that really drive the timing. Yeah. Okay. So. About ten minutes to go. We've been answering questions along the way. Yeah, yeah. So we're 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 probably doing pretty good on time. We won't be able to stay a whole lot longer yep. with the questions. So okay. yeah, we'll just continue on. Variety. Where does data come from? Well, I was sort of starting to talk about this, wasn't I? Um, so we could probably rip through this pretty quickly. Really, domains are set up for pretty much anything. Particularly, you know, I talked about topics, which are the can query. They're not particularly. They're not. They're, they're not really against any data. Data source and people plug in all sorts of different data sources into into the JasperSoft environment. So any, any data you can plug into in JasperSoft and run a query, you can have have uh, a lot of interactivity with. Um, and you know, domains, as I said, uh, they don't they don't really they don't really require a particular structure like all that with um, uh, with you know fact and dimension tables, etc. Um, so yeah, there's there is no no need for ETL, um, but in general, um, in general, I mean, I have seen people, you know, you do all of against the transactional environment. This is certainly possible, but it does. People do tend to ETL it out into, into a separate data source. So. Um, and you can see there. That's, and I was. This is some of the things I was alluding to earlier. Um, domains come from any. SQL 92 data source, OLAP needs you know, that sort of data source as well as in Star Snowflake schema, and topics pretty much come from anywhere um, without requiring the TL. Some of the things there. So, um, you know, and and some some things we drive towards are you know consistency of experience. It doesn't matter where the data is coming from. The reports and analysis are essentially providing the same. The same user experience. So we've done things like, um, and some of our demos on the, you know, we use Amazon heavily for various things. Um, uh, we had a we had our Amazon demo instance, and we were looking at um, uh, birth data. Um, uh, you see, this is some of the demos uh, on on Jefferson.com, for example. Um, so there we started with. This, this data about births in the U.S. over 40 years, broken down by year and date, and, uh, you know, various metrics about the mother's age, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, state that the birth was in, and so forth. 150 million, I think it is. Um, yeah, some domain. impressive number like that, yeah. where it just like boggles your mind. <laughs> right. So um, initially, we we started up with we. Have that data in a um, sitting out on, uh, in the Google BigQuery environment, which uses a, a web service um, call, and we set up a topic for that. Um, so, uh, and that was coming. You know, you were seeing that through the uh, through our 
the visualization um, environment. And so, you know, the underlying query was underlying queries were happening very quickly and pulling in. And then we we, we flipped it over. We moved the data into um, uh, the Amazon Redshift environment, which is a new uh, data warehouse oriented uh, uh, database that Amazon hosts, so the data warehouse in the sky, and that we that's essentially SQL behind scenes. It looks like Postgres database, um, and so we flipped around the domain. Uh, we put a domain in place, we went from the topic, which is using Google BigQuery, to using a domain um, a domain that was looking into the, uh, the Postgres uh, the Redshift data. Um, so the user experience was the same, and the interactivity etc. was the same too. So that's the sort of thing that we, we were trying to go for. Um, and so that's I was just characterizing. Yeah, the topics are, are related domains because of the, that user experience. And I have to say, you know, uh, in back to the, the original question of where does data come from? It's just it's just easier with, with domains and topics. Right. Um, volume, size of data. What can be processed by these? Um, they both they both have um, uh, a lot of uh, push down capabilities, so they use the database very heavily. All that does a lot better on the on the caching side as you said the tables. Um, but a lot of a lot of the benefit of that is just driven by you know some of the structures that um, uh, that uh, all that imposes. You know, it just does a lot rather than a more general sort of thing that uh, domains and topics do. Um, so definitely, I'd say you know all is the winner there just in terms of sheer volume. But you know we are getting you know better and better over time on the, on the domain and topic end, and that that will continue. Um, so, so in conclusion, there's no there's no sort of silver bullets on this. You know, you always have to worry about where, where, you know the the quality of the data, its structure, um, how fre frequent it's being updated, um, how you want people to interact with it. Um, uh, I mean, at, at the at the moment, the OLAP environment is much more powerful in the calculation sense and uh, does scale better um, in terms of the volumes, but you know, you do have to do some work to make that happen. Um, we have some, you know, so we, you know, this we're trying to do a lot of convergence over periods of time to, to make uh, the whole, you know, data visualization experience consistent across data sources. Um, so expect, you know, the domains are set to take a lot more future. That's fair enough to say. Well, at least there'll be more and more sort of blending in amongst that. So. Yeah, and and that's exciting. There, there's talks of domains. Calling upon, um, you know, calling upon OLAP technology if they need it, that kind of thing, and, that, yep. and that's certainly exciting. And and another thing is that you you really don't have to choose both. Mm -hmm. um, now, you might be you might be bound by a licensing um, thing. You know, the mm -hmm. professional edition of JasperSoft comes with domains. The enterprise mm -hmm. edition comes with domains and OLAP. But when you have both, you can employ both. Like maybe you yeah. have some reasons why you might want to connect directly into MongoDB, and then you have mm -hmm. a traditional data warehouse with an OLAP, you know, solution. So there's, yes, there is no silver bullet, and you don't have to pick one or the over the other. Like as yeah. far as end users are concerned, they click, and the data comes back. Mm -hmm. Whether that comes from OLAP or from a domain or from a topic, it's the same kind of interface. Mm -hmm. and so that that helps a lot. Um, so I, I have just a couple questions. I know we have about four minutes, um, mm -hmm. and I know you're a busy guy, Sherman. So we'll we'll try to knock out uh, one or two more questions mm -hmm. before wrapping up. If that's okay. Sure. So um, yeah, one last uh, interesting question here. Um, are you are you saying that we need clean data to use OLAP? Like for a sales record, do we need to know the date, the item, the buyer, the seller, and any other dimensions? How well would OLAP perform when there are some dimensions that are unknown? Well, you know, I'd sort of I'd flip that around. Um, uh, you know, the, the basis of business intelligence is the, the quality of the data that you have. You can't answer a question if you don't have the data that the question relies on. 
for example. So if you're if you don't have access to particular things, maybe it's something of a, uh, a stage you're going through, right? You may start off small and then build out a, a some sort of data over time. You're just not going to be able to answer those questions. That's what it, that's what it, what it boils down to. Um, uh, so you, know, you probably have your your customers um, uh, looking for um, you know asking you for things that you don't have. And, and if uh, like if I put a null for you know a particular, I, I guess in my fact table, maybe the question is more about uh, okay, I've I've got for a particular dimension like uh, location. Maybe mm -hmm. I don't know for every single order where the customer's from, but for some of them, I do know. How does mm -hmm. how would nulls work? I guess in that case. Uh. There is some things around, you know, a ragged hierarchy. So within a particular dimension, all all the all the values may not be down. You know, say you have five levels, and the dimension's got, you know, you, you, you go back to terminology. People talk about a dimension and a hierarchy. That's like time or product, right? And then within time, for example, you've got the year, quarter, month, day of month. Those are different levels. Right? I've seen some some situations where people have got a ragged a ragged hierarchy, so they don't, you know, even within the the, the fixed set of, uh, of levels, they don't fill in all the values. So when you sort of look through that through the you know, sort of uh, interacting with the data, you'll see these gaps. Won't, not everything will be filled in, which is fine. I mean that's that's just life. Um, I've also we've got, there's also some capabilities in the um, in the uh, uh, in the OLAP environment to uh, deal with with real hierarchies like a, uh, a management structure, which has got different departments and you know uh, different different numbers of departments you know below a particular level um, within the uh, uh, within the organisation, for example. Um, so you know that, those are the sort of two ways in which I've seen people deal with nulls. Otherwise, you can't. You know, if you have a sort of null in the middle of, you know, like if you had a year, you had a blank quarter, and then you had a month. That does, you know, the, the, these hierarchies do tend to be, you know, they're dependent upon one another. You may lose, uh, may have a little detail down at the lower levels, as we get into the, what I call ragged hierarchy. Um, or you know, use this sort of hierarchical structure to do a lot of the management. Um, but really, the you know the whole the whole structure um, should be at a particular point. All the all the levels above the particular point should be filled in. Otherwise, you're just going to miss information. Right, right, makes sense. Um, okay, I, I've got uh, two very quick questions. So. When you're doing row-level security um, mm -hmm. in the OLAP solution, mm -hmm. how, how does caching work at that point? Uh, because you can't really cache. Um, the the filtering is applied in memory, much in the same way the main the, the main stuff is the same. Um, uh, so because those uh, those results are held in the cache at a very fine fine level of detail, it's it's, it's relatively easy to. Well, I mean, the engine is smart. It, it, the engine does that. Um, does that? Uh, you know, applies the filters afterwards. Okay. Okay. I think with domains, because it's kind of like the query yep. is the key. It's the cache key. I think with domains, you would have to requery your data source. Mm, yeah. yeah because the, the basically, if, when the where clause changes, it means that the yeah. query is different. Therefore, you must re. Query, I suppose, but I, I guess you're saying in OLAP, it's a little. No, it, it'll that that cache really would say across individual. Oh, users. okay, okay. Individual uh, user interactions. So whenever they, you know, the the the, the fill is applied accordingly. I think domains are less less smart on that sort of side at this point. All right, and the final question is. Um, have we done any experimentation with Hadoop Hive um, dialect for the Mondrian engine? Um, it has been done, um, but uh, 
we are not we're uh, it's not out in a released version of Mondrian yet um, which is the underlying this is the open source engine behind uh, behind um, I think we're just about there with there was some last things that we're doing on the domain end so sort of the domains will go up this time um, just to okay so that's that's kind of a point for the domain the yeah. domain team is that uh, we'll, we might support it quicker than uh, yeah. and and one thing with hive guys um, is is that inherent latency when, when you make a yeah. query for live data exploration might be a little annoying to wait right. for data to, to come back but <clears throat> it allows you to connect to your Hadoop cluster which could have mm -hmm. you know, petabytes of data or whatever okay. cool um, so uh, so we'll, so we'll wrap up the the next um, Tech talk is uh, next Tuesday. Now that's going to be in a European time zone, uh, mm -hmm. 10 a.m. for so for those of you tuning in from the Americas, you'll just catch it on the uh, YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a playlist for Jasper Soft Tech Talks. Make sure to subscribe to that and check out you know this show, past shows, and future shows on there. And uh, Sherman, thank you very much for uh, coming on the show. I was. Um, I, I yeah I, I actually learned a lot out of this and I hope the yep. audience did as well. <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>